Uh, tonight, I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker to you. Dr. Marianne Borelli is Professor of Government at Connecticut College, Chair of the Department of Government and International Relations, a prolific author, and groundbreaking scholar on the subject of the status and role of America's First Lady. She is the recipient of numerous fellowships and grants and received the John S. King Memorial Teaching Award, recognizing her high standards of teaching excellence and concern for students. Dr. Borelli is no stranger to the library. She is a recipient of the uh, Ford Presidential Foundation Research Travel Grant and has visited twice before, studying the appointments of women to the presidential cabinet and investigating several aspects of Mrs. Ford's tenure in the White House. Both visits contributed to her books, The President's Cabinet, Gender, Power, and Representation, and The Politics of the President's Wife. She's back in the research room this week, at, and uh, we're thrilled to have her here and to be able to work with her. Now tonight, we move beyond the tea and crumpets biographies of our first ladies, where no core role was identified and no connections or consistencies were established among their tenures. From these earlier works, it appears that these were 37 disparate women with no commonality other than having been married to a U.S. president. Our guest provides the first systematic study of the roles, the structure, and the performance of the office run by the president's wife. The topic is especially appropriate because this month we recognize our first lady, Betty Ford's birthday, and consider her many substantive accomplishments. President Harry Truman said, I hope someday someone will take time to evaluate the true role of the wife of the president and to assess the many burdens she has to bear and the contributions she makes. Tonight, Marianne Borelli fulfills his wish. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm so glad to see you, especially since it was sleeting this afternoon. And <laughs> I thought, oh, it's Michigan. They'll be used to it. So here we go. I have to start with a word of thanks. Over the past uh, several days, I think every archivist in this building has bailed me out, helped me find records. And of course, I only have a few days to be here, so I don't think I've sat in the chairs, which means, of course, I've been asking for more records than usual. And they're extraordinarily generous with their expertise and their time. I also have to thank the Gerald R. Ford Foundation because I would never have had a first book. And without a first book, you don't get tenure, which means you never have the opportunity to have a second book. <laughs> so please convey my thanks. Um, say nice things about the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. And my third set of thanks, and political scientists always do things in trinities, is to you for coming. So thank you very much for being here. And I will try and keep you awake, entertained, and informed. Ah, here we go. <laughs> right? OK. So you know who I am. And I'm going to find out how, who you are and how good you are. You had a quiz. I'm a teacher, right? Except this was a quiz that you had to do well on because I figured pooled expertise. You were allowed to talk to one another. No Harvard upsets here, right? Everybody can talk to one another and get the answers. So let's see how you did, OK? Are you ready? That was kind of half-hearted. Yes. All right. In my church, you know, we've got the amen thing going. Here we go. So this one you should have known. <laughs> Extra points if you knew that there was also a Warren in her name. Um, and her area of expertise um, was the arts. Okay? So no surprises. Number one had to go to Betty Ford. You're grading yourselves. <laughs> Be careful. Okay. Um, Jacqueline Lee Bouvier Kennedy Onassis, okay, and her, um, one of the things that she was most famous for, of course, was, was White House conservation. You may not know that she was also responsible for historic preservation in the entire area surrounding the White House. So this was quite a, a commitment for her. And this would be Lou Henry Hoover, okay, president of the Girl Scouts before and after being first lady. Uh, she was 
very dedicated, she was real president of the Girl Scouts, yes. Um, she was very dedicated to child development, and she was also known for mobilizing um, relief work throughout the Depression. Of course, she also worked with her husband in Belgium um, after World War I. Hillary Diane Rodham Clinton, full names, not enough to know Hillary or Rodham. Okay. Um, of course, health care in the first term, and then towards the end of the first term and throughout the second term, it would have been human rights. Okay. Now, how many of you knew that Thelma Catherine? Aha! No. Uh -huh. There's one. Okay, uh, Pat is a nickname. She's of Irish descent, rather like the Borelli standing in front of you. It's the part that you can't see with me. Um, and so this was a nickname which she much preferred. Her area of expertise was, um, as she said, people. She was famous for writing letters. Um, she would write over 400 letters a week individually. Um, yes, very proud of that, for understandable reasons. I personally like the fact that she would randomly drop in and just take over a White House tour. So you got a tour from the White House, of the White House from, from the First Lady. I'm hoping you recognize Michelle Obama. But you may not have known Levon is her middle name, okay? And of course, childhood obesity and, and healthy eating. And this would be Anna, Eleanor, remember, Double Roosevelt, she married her cousin. I love this picture. She's deep in a mine in Nevada, or as they like to be known, Nevada, All right? Claudia Alta, later Lady Bird Taylor Johnson, she signed all of her checks all through her life as Claudia Alta. She would prefer not to be known as Lady Bird. Okay. Barbara Pierce Bush, that's John Ashcroft behind her when he was governor of Missouri. Okay. And this would be Mamie Eisenhower in pink. Okay. Um, she was very, very um, proud of her housekeeping and her homemaking. Uh, so this is a picture that, that she really, really reflects that commitment on her part. She saw it as, as, a, as a critical task and, a, and, and as an important role, not one that should simply be abandoned. I also like the story. She saved leftovers. So if you were at a state dinner and you had chicken, then the briefing luncheon the next day would probably be chicken salad because there were to be no leftovers not used. She also made um, the president supply the meat for his own stag dinners. So they were stag dinners that he had done the hunting for, which I think always takes commander in chief to a new level when you have to hunt for the food that's on the table. Okay. Eleanor Rosalind Smith Carter, of course, was known for her work in mental health systems reform. Community care centers were really uh, an advance that she made, facilitated. Laura Lane Welch Bush, okay, um, really known again for literature and literacy. Uh, she also took action in regard to child development as a, as a former librarian, um, public school librarian, and later on also was active in, in human rights issues, but primarily literature and literacy. Nancy Reagan. Anne Francis Nancy Robbins Davis Reagan. Nancy was a name that she gave herself. It was not hers. Aha! More surprises. Okay. Um, Robbins was her father's name. She preferred not to be known by that. She preferred, um, she was adopted by her stepfather Davis, and so she preferred to drop the Robbins herself. And then this is Elizabeth Virginia Bess Wallace Truman. You may not have known that her area of expertise and the thing that she lobbied for quite ferociously but very quietly was medical research, particularly cancer research. And she was responsible for, for really advancing cancer research funding in the federal government to a formidable degree. Yes. So, you have the full list. Let's see who got what. How many 42s? How many people got all of them right? <laughs> oh, I figured there'd be a few of you. 41. There's one 41 in the back. Okay, how about, oh, and since this is going to be on Michigan TV, just so that the viewers at home know what we're talking about, everybody got a quiz sheet, and you had to come up with the formal name 
the area of expertise and correctly link it to the portrait. So for those of you who are at home and viewing this, go back to the beginning of the show and see what your score is. There we go. Okay, we've, we've caught the audience up with the audience. So I've got 141. How about a 40? Oh, 41 should really be proud. 39. You need me. 38. 37. I'm shocked. There's gray hair in this room. You lived through most of this. 36. 35. 34. Well, I will stop there. Okay. But who's my 41, please? I think it was in the back. Oh, okay. Well, then I have to keep going. 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30. I'm starting to speed up. 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22. Okay, so there's this book that you want to buy. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to have fun. Now that I know that I don't have all experts on my hands, we're just going to cook tonight, all right? Okay, here we go. So I popped all the names up here. Um, I tactfully put the Republicans in red and the Democrats in blue. So you, that's going to be the code throughout this entire process. And the thing that I would ask you to think about, oh dear, I'm still new to these mics. The thing that I would ask you to think about is what relationship you have with the First Ladies. Because the primary function that these women perform is public outreach. So their job is to establish a connection with you. And their job is to mediate um, the president's message to you and your views of that message back to the president. So the relationship that you have with them is a very important one to the presidency, not simply to them as individuals, as women, as wives, as people who care about the president, but really literally because that's their job to make a connection. And I think that if you're sitting there and you're surprised by their names, it's like, why? Okay. Is that because the media is ignoring some aspect of these women? Is it because you're skipping over them? You're more interested in the president? After all, it's just the wife, right? Um, is it alternatively um, because you're thinking you might know them as celebrities? You don't think of them as policymakers or decision makers? Um, my co what connection do you have with the First Ladies? And what did you learn about yourself as you were going through this? That you know them perhaps in a more popular way than in a political way? So these are some of the things to be thinking about as we go through. Um, because I'm really glad that I'm going to be surprising you tonight. So here we go. Um, one of the things that we know is that typically when we talk about first ladies, we hear that they have projects or causes. Okay? We don't often hear that they are invested in policy. And I think that that's a mistake. I think that what that language suggests is that we're devaluating, devaluing or perhaps not appropriately valuing the work of the first ladies. Right? So if you look, for example, at this C-SPAN uh, excerpt, Promoting the Arts, or you look at Michelle Obama's book, The Story of the White House Kitchen and Gardens Across America, what you're really seeing are, are presentations that allow you to be comfortable with women involved in decision-making and policy. Because that's not the norm. We're seeing more women elected to elite office, but again, we're just not seeing that many, and it's still a new phenomenon. But if you, so, so there's this unexpected quality to women as policymakers. And yet, first ladies are supposed to be leaders. There's an office within the White House that they run. And it is an important office. On the, I'm going to do everything from how you're seeing it. So I'll just, I'm going to not kind of keep saying on your left, OK? It's just left for tonight. So on the left, we have, this is, this is Lady Bird Johnson meeting with the top members of her staff. And of course, on the right um, is Eleanor Roosevelt meeting with members of the, the WAVES. OK? 
Okay? My aunt was a wave, so I had a soft spot for them. And what we're looking at here is really that process that I was mentioning before about mediating with the public, but also leading. Okay? They're directing an outreach process from the White House. At the same time, they're very controversial. Okay? I love this picture. On the left, okay, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, I cheated. This is from when they were in Arkansas, and uh, Bill Clinton, as you may know, won the governorship and then lost his first reelection campaign. And one of the things that happened was it was blamed on Hillary, right? She was then Hillary Rodham, and it was, she's just too liberal. She's one of those upstart northerners who moved down here. She's a carpetbagger. And so one of the things that she did in the second reelection campaign was that she adopted Clinton. And she was very forthright about the fact that she supported her husband. But it remained a point of contention. So Lady Bird Johnson, as a southerner, a Texan, right, um, and she, they put together these t-shirts. And you can't read them from way back there. But what they did was, in capital letters, they put all the first lady's birth names on the t-shirt, OK? So Claudia Alta Taylor Johnson, right? And here are the two of them modeling the t-shirt. It's all right for a woman to have a birth name as well as a marriage name. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this, the, the, the picture on the right, of course, is that Michelle Obama is the only one who looks angry. However, um, and you lived through all of this, I think, many of you, you know that the dragon lady, Nancy Reagan, was intensely controversial, right? Oh my gosh, Rosalind Carter, she went to a cabinet meeting. <laughs> really, right? Laura Bush got the flip side of that. She's not doing enough, right? So it's kind of interesting to me, like, remember when first ladies were actually ladies? And it's kind of like, well, actually, we, we've objected to all of their depictions of womanhood while they were in office. It's only later that nostalgia makes them acceptable. And this is really kind of what happens. Now, I want to be very clear, and this might be totally familiar to you, so I apologize if that's the case. I'm not just talking about the, the sex, um, sex as a noun, of, of the woman. Okay, I'm talking about her gender role performance. So in other words, how does she understand being a woman? What, what is the way in which this person is acting as feminine? Okay. And this is something that if you think about it, there's a lot of different views on this, right? There are those who sit there and say, well, what you are biologically is what you should be socially, right? So that the biological and the social just smack together, and that's the way it should be, and that's the way it goes. There are others who say, well, there's the biological, and then there's the social, and the two can be very separate, okay? We can have um, tomboys, like little girls who are really, really good at being little girls, and they also happen to be really fantastic football players, right? Um, and so forth and so on. In my hometown, um, the, the soccer league, for example, is, is co-ed. So what we're really asking here is, okay, these are, these are women who have self-identified as being female, but how are they understanding their roles? How do they choose to act, okay? to perform. And I want to be clear that for me, perform is not some kind of nasty little side kind of swipe. I happen to think that politics at its best is really good theater. Like Shakespeare is really good theater. Okay, So not like, I'm not using this, this as a swipe. I think it's a really important question to ask. And if you're in the statistical minority, because there are still comparatively few women in elite positions within the executive branch, then asking what roles women are allowed to play, are encouraged to play, have the opportunity to play, is a very, very important question. And that's what's being brought up here, I think, with this depiction. So with that in mind, let's see what happens. You may remember Michelle Obama addressed the Democratic National Convention. Within 48 hours, that speech had received over 2.5 million hits on YouTube. 2.5 million hits in 48 hours. Now, the next speaker that was next close to that, this is before her husband spoke, so you don't see um, Mr. Obama up here. The next most popular speaker was, not surprisingly, Bill Clinton with 1.5 million. Right? Now, I know he's a former president, she's a current first lady, da 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 But this really does go to the level of scrutiny. So here, here is a position that's closely scrutinized, right? 
Not necessarily. This is Michelle Obama in blue and Laura Bush in red for three years after their husband's inauguration. So the, the scrutiny that these women encounter is really highly uneven, okay? And that has a lot to do with context. It matters that they are women. It matters that, that Michelle Obama is an African-American woman, that, that Laura Bush was a white woman. There's all kinds of different identity questions that are arising here, especially in a branch that is very strongly, very emphatically masculine in the traditional kind of authoritative military sense of that masculine identity. And I'm a Navy brat, okay, so don't hurt me. I'm using military again in a respectful way. But the thing that I love, this is the official cabinet portrait of the, of the Clinton administration, and you'll notice that they put Madeline front and center. Okay? <laughs> this is when she was UN ambassador. When is a UN ambassador standing that close to the front? Hello, right? So they're really kind of for, foregrounding the woman, okay? Um, it's a lot harder to find Janet Reno in that picture because she's wearing black that day, but here she is, okay? Now, the thing that I love about the Vanity Fair, okay, and I know it's Vanity Fair, but Annie Leibovitz, Vanity Fair has a way of drawing out some of the perceptions that we carry around as a society and asking us to think about them. War and Destiny, that cover, really brings forward the idea of like the, the commander in chief, the declaration of war, the need for a strong, assertive, powerful, authoritative, masculine leader. And you can see this is Bush, right, Cheney, and Powell. These are three men who do not apologize for being strong alpha males, all right? I heard a right, and it was a low voice. Good, that was good. <laughs> okay? All right, so now let's look at this one, all right? So how are first ladies responded to this? They're supposed to be leaders, but they're gender outsiders, right? There's no single conception of womanhood where they can take refuge right now. Women are pretty much lightning rods for the culture wars, and incidentally, it's plural wars. We can't even agree on what we're fighting about, okay? This is a big question, all right? And so what I did was just kind of take one step back into a time before, this is just as Betty Friedan is publishing The Feminine Mystique. And here's a picture that kind of really draws forward the complications of being a policy entrepreneur. Jacqueline Kennedy in the pink, okay, so she's doing, no pink, pink is important, okay. This is the Mona Lisa, one of the most famous portraits of a woman, right, the mysterious Mona Lisa, okay. And how did she get it out of France for the first time in several hundred years? She charmed Charles de Gaulle. And this is one of the most famous, uh, what do you call it, cartoons? Yes, from the time period. Um, Mrs. de Gaulle wakes up and Charles is dreaming of Jacqueline. <laughs> okay? True enough, true enough, there was charm involved. But it took a heck of a lot more than charm to get the Mona Lisa out of France for a visit to the United States, that upstart nation, okay? And you can see that really thinking about the amount of negotiation and policy that went into it that was initiated by this first lady. So how have these women been effective policy entrepreneurs? They are very determined, they are very self-aware, and they are highly strategic. So here we go, all right? They have crafted a gender role that allows them to really think strategically about how they will complement or contradict enduring masculine norms within the branch. Okay? That's very important. Think about Jack Kennedy. Have you got him in your head? Playing football, right? Leading the free world, demonstrating vigor. Now, take Jacqueline Kennedy out of the picture. Okay? This is a man who had a chronic bad back, who could barely move some days, right? Who had Addison's disease, who was too young for the office, okay? Jacqueline played an extraordinarily important part in that administration in speaking to his vigor, his manliness, his authoritativeness. Now, there's more involved, I understand that, but I want you to be thinking about this in terms of image, in terms of substance and in terms of power. So with that in mind, let's take on a tough current case, and that would be Michelle Obama, because this is a very complex and difficult role that she is playing. 
African American women in the United States have not been generally respected as mothers, right? They're welfare moms, okay? They're not good mothers. They're single mothers. There's a whole list of critiques that are address, addressed stereotypically to African American women that they have been trying to live down and correct for generations. Okay? They also are not widely respected as leaders. Okay? When they are seen as leaders, it's often in the sense of, oh, well, they're demeaning to men, right? They're emasculating, right? So Michelle Obama, when she comes into office, is not only stepping into an office that is really constructed about white womenhood, right? But she's also stepping in knowing that she's bringing images that others are going to find either necessary to live down, here's an opportunity for African American women to have a powerful positive role model, or that others are feeling she can only live up to. One of those women, uppity, dangerous, okay? And what does she do? She proceeds, she takes a year to get, the, get her girls settled in school, right? Mom and chief. And then she comes forward and she begins to really develop the Let's Move program. These are three images that I'd like you to just think about in terms of seeing the crafting. Let's start with this one. This was on um, her first visit out of the White House. She went to a military base, uh, I believe it was Fort Hood. I'm a Navy brat, so the Army, you know, it's kind of... Uh. <laughs> They're all bases. I apologize. And this is really a classic shot. You've seen this shot many, many times, but usually with the president, right? Stepping off of Air Force One, here's the military guard, right? Confident, poised, authoritative, and this time it's the first lady. So here's a first lady borrowing and presenting the masculine ideal, right? The modern American, the jet travel. Here, this is the visit to Italy, okay, um, in front of the Italian guard, and I have to tell you Borelli, right? We know how to do uniforms in Italy, <laughs> okay? Just check out the Vatican, right? Okay. All right. So what is she doing here? Bright yellow, okay? The hourglass figure, her famous dress style. There's no question of who the woman is, okay? This is the compliment, the feminine compliment to the masculine commander, right? Yet, again, notice, same height. In fact, she might have an inch on him given the way that they're just striding, okay? So there's a femininity, a very, there's feminine power, feminine strength complementing the masculine strength in this picture, but not borrowing, right? And yet, there's a centrality to it. And then finally, essence. Okay, this is um, marketed largely for African-American women. Okay? I love this pose, right? So often when women are move, leaning forward or posed in, in uh, popular pictures, they're kind of off balance, you know, like the whole like one leg up, you know, or leaning or they're crouching or whatever. She's leaning forward, she's got the hand on the hip and it's like, come on, are you there? You! Okay? This is like, her, she's enjoying it, she's, her mouth is open, she's smiling. This is a poised, comfortable, authoritative, strong woman, okay? And this is in that context. So again, what we're seeing here is a celebration of the feminine. So you're looking here sometimes, right? Borrowing and thereby challenging the masculine, sometimes complimenting and thereby reinforcing the masculine, and sometimes celebrating the feminine. Now, if you're kind of sitting there and thinking that's an awfully lot to read into three pictures, Right, because I know you. There's suspicious looks on faces out there. I would stress to you that Mad um, I almost said Madeline. Michelle is very much in control of the framing of all of her visuals. Okay, um, when Vogue arrived to do her shoot, they were shocked to find out that they would not be handling the entire shoot. Okay, so this is a first lady who is very much in charge of the visuals, very much in charge of the presentation. She negotiates, she discusses, she decides what goes out with her staff. So this is exactly as I said before, self-aware and intentional. So with that in mind, here are the three lessons that I would draw um, from not just Michelle Obama, but from all of the modern first ladies, because I find Michelle very representative in her self-presentation. Mrs. Obama is not 
distinctive. She's more skilled, I think, in many ways than many of them. But that's different from saying she's, she's different. So um, gender matters. That gender is, has many facets, um, and we'll be going through them. And that uh, gender affects policy. So let's just look at these three lessons, and let me just kind of have you walk through the modern first lady, since you didn't do very well on that quiz. Okay? So gender matters. So here we go with first mama. All right? Um, and this is Betty Ford using a gender ideology, right? First mama. What's threatening about a mama? Right? It's like mom and chief. Okay? And she's really reaching out across gender boundaries and gender barriers. And you want to remember that Vietnam is not that long ago in the Ford administration, right? So we are still very much in living memory of a student rights movement, of a free speech movement. Um, the presidency is not going to be viewed as, as a happy thing, okay? And I was reading today in the ERA correspondence that I had several mothers writing in saying that, you know, my child was sent to Vietnam. My son was sent to Vietnam, and now you want to send my daughter into the military with this ERA that you're advocating, okay? So there's a real gender bound, generational boundary here that first mama gets over. That's her CB handle, right? On the other hand, gender ideologies can divide, okay? Re Nancy Reagan was an ex intensely polarizing figure, intensely polarizing. And despite all the efforts to kind of, as you can see in the, the left, portray her as just the wife, right? Time Magazine, Nancy Reagan's growing role, the bright red dress, the love of the imperial, the willingness to assert, okay, is very important. Don Reagan might have been the most noisy departure from the White House, but he was not the only personnel issue that Nancy weighed in on. And in point of fact, most of the First Ladies have been very influential in, in, in personnel decisions throughout the White House. Bess Truman selected Harry Truman's press secretary for him. So don't discount the quiet ones. Lesson two, personal and public, theory and practice, formal and informal. Gender is not just an idea. So. Personal and public, um, behind the scenes, this is a picture of, of uh, the Johnsons working on a speech, which is very common. Most of the presidents really attribute three tasks to their wives. Personnel, which I always think that's fascinating. Oh, my wife sees people much more clearly than I do. Your president. <laughs> Hello. Um, but on the other hand, there is evidence that that's the case. Presidents don't want to be disliked. First ladies apparently make peace with that. Okay? No, 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 that's, that's quite serious. So presidents don't want to fire anyone and, and try very hard not to, whereas first ladies are willing to say somebody's not doing their job and they're not loyal or, or, or. So personnel, speeches, and media. Those are the three things that, that first ladies have been particularly powerful for in the back door, quietly. Congressional testimony, this is Rosalind Carter testifying on behalf of her Mental um, Health Systems Reform Act. Um, the other individuals who testified before Congress, here's your chance. Who do you think they are? Any ideas? Clinton. Hillary Clinton. That's good. I, I hope you got that one. Who else? Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt. Perfect. And Laura Bush. On the importance of, of legislation for child development. So. Theory and practice. Um, first ladies have been particularly skilled with, with uh, making and using symbols. This is one of the most famous pictures of Patricia ne of Pat Nixon standing against the flag. Another symbol uh, on the right, the, fir the first ladies in the White House have been very clever. Again, not a nasty word here. Um, very thoughtful in how they've used the White House. But they have also really negotiated budgets, programs, and the like. When Jacqueline Kennedy decided to take on the conservation of the, of the White House, she did so um, through public-private partnerships. So she recruited people who had extraordinary development potential, a euphemism for they were very wealthy and willing to give money, right? And thank God for them, the DuPonts stepped in and made it possible to really develop her initiatives, okay? So public-private partnerships, 
Lots of legal negotiations, that kind of money, those kinds of antiques. This is a very difficult thing. So this is a picture about the, of the opening of one of the newly refurbished rooms. And what you're looking at there is Jacqueline Kennedy in white, so you can see her a little bit more clearly. And then leaders from Congress and the National Archives Administration, who sponsored my trip here. Thank you very much. So I had to get them in a picture. Okay. Formal and informal. So formal structures, um, there have been three first ladies who had presidential appointments. So this is Eleanor Roosevelt, who was appointed um, the assistant of the Office of Civilian Defense. She is pictured here with New York Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, whom she got fired. Didn't do his job adequately. Um, she was fired about three weeks after he was. Congress did not like having a first lady in charge. Um, in terms of more ad hoc organizations, uh, Barbara Bush is probably one of the most outstanding in this regard with her grassroots mobilization on behalf of literacy, particularly family literacy. But these women are not alone. Again, um, you're really looking at women who know how to build institutions and organizations. So gender shapes policy very powerfully. So let's go back. You've already had all of those different kinds of policy expertise that these first ladies did and used. And think about it for a minute in terms of patterns. Okay? As, as Donna so kindly said, I, I try to get beyond biography, which I think is fantastic. But political scientists, we always look for more than one. We're always looking for the patterns. So here's some patterns. Okay? One of the dominant themes that really connects the different policies that have been advanced by the First Ladies is the role of nurturer and mother. It's an honored and highly respected role for women, which gives this policy approach a great deal of credibility. And sure enough, right, Lou Henry Hoover, Nancy Reagan, Barbara Bush, Michelle Obama, all of these individuals have really tapped into the power and the credibility of being a mother and a nurturer in their policy work. Moral guardian, okay? The idea that the woman has an insight into the aspirations of a nation, right? The call to be better. So Eleanor Roosevelt, Mamie Eisenhower, homemaking, think about that like deeply and richly, to make a home. I mean, that's such an extraordinary thing, okay? And Pat Nixon, to call forth the better spirits, right? That's how she always thought of volunteerism. If people could just do more, think of the world we would live in. So again, a role that has long been ascribed highly valued for women. Caregiver. Bess Truman, Rosalind Carter, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Okay. Medical research, mental health care, Health care reform and human rights. This is Clinton at the Beijing conference in 1995. Now, the thing that I find fascinating about the Beijing conference, if you haven't read the speech, get it online. It's an amazing speech. I gave it to my students without putting a name on it and asked who they thought had delivered it. And after a discussion, everybody agreed it was a presidential speech. To make those kinds of proclamations, to assert so profoundly um, and so clearly the priorities of, of the United States, it was a presidential speech. And when they found that it was a first lady, the conversation was very frank. Is this what a wife should do? Is this what a woman should do? Is this how an executive should, should delegate? Um, it, was a, it was a fascinating conversation about gender norms. Caregiver is a very authoritative role here and certainly was for both Beth Truman and Rosalind Carter as well. And finally, cultural conservator, right? To say that there are things that we value, to say that some things have been beautifully or well done, okay? Jacqueline Kennedy, Lady Bird Johnson, Betty Ford, and Laura Bush. Now, the thing that I would draw your attention to here is that this is not just about happy stuff. Oh, beautification, it's all going to be pretty, you know? Lady Bird Johnson said that the thing about beauty was that it was such a fragile word that people didn't understand it. If you look at her beautification program, in many ways what she's doing is using feminine language, right, as a counterpoint to the masculine language of the war on poverty. Okay? Right? But she's also, in beautification, 
walking into a situation of great rural and urban poverty and saying that this is not the way that it has to be and this is not the way that it should be and this is not the way that it will be. So in addition to planting untold numbers of flowers and trees, right, she also argued very heavily and very strongly for things like rat extermination. You don't get much blunter than exterminating rats, right? She also argued for a variety of different initiatives that would provide uh, youngsters and young adults with employment over the summer months. So this was the early kinds of outreach that we see in, in the Johnson administration. Okay, so what you should be aware of, because I gave you all those blue and red cues, right, is that in every role you have Republicans and Democrats. And in every role, although I've kind of identified singularly, you know, a particular woman, it's as easy to sit there and look at the Girl Scouts and say, well, okay, so she put those in Nurturer and Mother, but why isn't she putting them in Moral Guardian? You know, she put the arts with Betty Ford in Cultural Conservator, but really isn't that about being a Moral Guardian, right? And on, you know, like, well, caregiver, why did she put health care reform and Hillary Clinton under caregiver instead of? And that's, that's what I would say is true, is that I've highlighted a particular role for each of these, these, these kinds of policies, but the sheer fact of the matter is that's one facet. And these four keep servicing again and again and again. So, when we see these women working under circumstances of great contradiction, we see them doing it very gracefully, right? You'll notice on the left, this is Mamie and Ike, of course, and her attention is totally focused on him. It's the presidency. What matters is the president. If you look at the right, however, this is the Lady Bird special. After President Johnson signed the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, he knew that he was basically signing away the support of the South, where segregation was so powerful and where black Americans were still not allowed to vote. And so he sent his wife into the South on a whistle-stop train tour from Alexandria, Virginia to New Orleans, Louisiana, and he told her, bring home the votes. Now, this was really deliberately strategic on Lyndon's point of view. He was trading on her identity as a white Southern woman to win the support of white Southerners. She was trusting that old norms of civility would allow them to at least listen to her. And this is the train that they outfitted for that ride, okay, uh, which made high 20s in the way of stops. There were three near riots, okay, with serious threats of violence. There were many times where she drew crowds of over 10,000. Okay. This was a very difficult tour. It was especially difficult um, at the personal level in that there was no air conditioning. None. There were no refrigeration units on the train. What they did from stop to stop was it was all planned out so that on one stop people would get on, right? And they would bring on the food and if you had a visitor, the visitors would arrive with flowers and so forth and so on. They would ride together to the next stop eating the food, enjoying the flowers. When people got off, they'd go off one door. The flowers went off the other door to a hospital. It was all organized. And coming in was fresh flowers, new politicians. So that you were always riding in the area that you had a supported elective official standing there and supporting Lady Bird Johnson as she sought votes for her husband. This was like clockwork. Highly independent, highly strategic. Not the Mamie Eisenhower depiction. So we're seeing the two elements here always in, in, contrib in contribution. So that's why my next project is going to be looking at campaigning. Because I think that that's where you really start understanding how this, this contradiction plays out. I also think campaigning is important because that's the central mechanism for legitimation in our, in our country, right? It's about getting elected and, and holding that office. So let me just give you a little preview of what's coming, because, you know, once you read my, my first First Lady's book, right, you've got to get the second one. I need to be popped up in those Amazon numbers. Have you seen them? Okay. So here's the campaign buttons. 
Yes. And that was, that was not waiting for the third term. That button surfaced pretty quick. Um, yes. Okay. Um, you may remember secondhand rows. Uh, Nancy Reagan was viewed as, as just too whatever, so she did the secondhand rows, right? Um, Betty's husband had an echo in Barbara's husband, okay? Um, I personally like the America's future is in villagers. That's the Clinton button, the green button in the corner. And then um, a very powerful and very assertive statement for social conservatives, Laura Bush, a real first lady. Okay, and 1980 was not easy, all right? So we did it before, we'll do it again for the Carters. Okay. Green, not red or blue there. So these, are, these buttons really go to the point that are they elected? No. Are they influencing the election process? I think so. By framing the president, by, by explaining the administration in a particular way, by mediating the messages between the president and the public. And I think it's because they have that role of honest broker, that role of being a go-between, that they draw so much comment, criticism, and support. People recognize power when it's being exercised. Okay? So this is, I just thought this was a fascinating pairing. This is on the left, one of the most famous pictures of, of the 1960 campaign. This is the Kennedys in West Virginia campaigning. Um, Kennedy, of course, <coughs> Jack, excuse me, Jack considered West Virginia pivotal. Uh, it was a state that was particularly suspicious of having a Roman Catholic in the White House, okay? Also a northerner. We do not talk like the Kennedys, incidentally, in Boston. I have to throw that in. So there's, there's a real, like, main kind of twang going on there that's really New England that's going to really great on West Virginian ears. So this is a very good test, okay, of, of Kennedy in West Virginia. And the wife is right there, behind him, hands behind her back, a double disassociation, right? But supportive, right? The face is engaged. There's, there's a quality there of, of really kind of standing in reflected light and comfortable with that. So. To me, it's all the more interesting then that Look would put out a magazine that kind of portrays her very differently. There's, there's a, I don't know, suspicious? The eyes are kind of slanting sideways, right? We're not sure about this whole enterprise with Jacqueline, right? Um, definitely a, a lowered décolletage. I think that's how that word's pronounced in the gown, right? And, and what's the header? What's the... The title, the females of the family are as formidable as the men. Okay? So we have these images, one from the campaign, one from the popular press. And what I would suggest to you is that that's what we see time and again with the first ladies. How do they image themselves? How do they control that image? And how are they, in turn, imaged and controlled? Right? So this is, I think this is a great shot. There's just such comfort and such agency in this picture. It's Lady Bird Johnson, Barbara Bush, Hillary Clinton, Betty Ford, Nancy Reagan. So it's a good one to end with. Thank you very much. You. Now, there's a mic in the back, which is not meant to send you away from me. It's just to point it out. And I do hope you'll ask questions, and I hope even more that I'll have some answers. <laughs> Professor Barry, thank you very much for a fine presentation. Thank you. Uh, as a historian, I'd like to ask you a simple question. Uh, why start with uh, Lou Hoover? How about first ladies before that? A uh, lack of sources, perhaps? Or is that a second book coming up? Or a third book? Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, I like you already. Um, the reason that I started with Hoover, there are different definitions of what constitutes or, or where the modern presidency begins. Some folks would say Nixon, because he had a very highly structured um, 
in, in my other life, I'm a bureaucratic analyst, which pretty much puts everybody to sleep, you know. Um, he had a very structured office with lots of departmentalization and specialization. Some folks go for a Roosevelt because, of course, the proliferation of offices with the Depression. I went with Hoover uh, because Hoover is the first presidency in which the president has multiple aides, and for that matter, so does the first lady. So I felt that they were really starting to have a sophistication in their organization. And I wanted to go as far back as possible so that I was really having to test my arguments. We're really spanning, at this point, it's the first women's movement for suffrage has, has happened, but it's still pretty new in 1928. It's still within living memory. We have the first, second women's rights in the 60s. Now we're in the third um, wave of the women's movement. So it gave me 80 plus years to really challenge myself and yet stay within what political scientists are comfortable saying is the modern presidency. In terms of sources, I think that, and, and I say this quite sincerely, NARA has done a really great job of working with the different presidencies. So there actually are pretty good sources further back, um, but that was, where I, that was where I made the cutting line. Thank you. by your categorization of all the first ladies and many of them fit into the structure that you laid out. It's not a simple question, so you can choose to answer as much as you want, but I'd like you to speculate about the time when we have the first female president and we have a first man or a first husband. First gentleman. And, and, and where does, what challenges does he face and where does he fit into the structure that you laid out for the feminist responsibility as First Lady? Okay. Um, I think that, that that's going to be really rough. Uh, not, <laughs> not just on the society that's going to be kind of sitting there trying to understand this person, right? But also on, on the First Gentleman, right? Because I'll give you a concrete example. All right, so James Bond. I'm switching gears totally. But you may remember there was a James Bond uh, film, and at the very end, he called, I don't remember which one. I'm not, I'm not that much of a fan, but I'm, I'm rather a fan. And so at the very end, James Bond calls, and he's put through to Margaret Thatcher in her kitchen, and she and Dennis are doing the dishes. Do you remember any of this? Yes, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Okay, good, they're out there. And so uh, Dennis is actually in an apron, and he's, he's wiping the dishes, right? And the whole thing is... Margaret Thatcher's like, oh, James, right? And you're just like, oh, this is really unfortunate of it. <laughs> Margaret's really unhappy right now. But Margaret was probably unhappy at being, you know, kind of flirting with James Bond. But if I was Dennis, I would have been livid because he was just standing there kind of like wiping the dishes going, I was on the phone, dear. You know, it's like, <laughs> wait, I mean, like, this is a man who is, is very accomplished. So I think that, that it's going to be a negotiation to really respect and recognize the first gentleman it, even more profoundly than it has been to recognize and, and respect the first ladies because uh, it's, it's considered socially and uh, maritally appropriate um, at least for some people, for the woman to support the man. It's not still entirely widespread support uh, for having the, the husband to support the wife. In evidence of that contention, I would point to Bill Clinton in the 2008 campaign. And I think that that was a really difficult campaign for Clint, Bill Clinton because he was stepping back and trying to find his way where he had no guides. And I, I actually saw Bill Clinton from a distance once, and he's, he's a physically large man, right? I mean, he, I was surprised by just, like, this tall person. And he's a former president, and he's very accomplished, and he's very bright. And all of a sudden, he was the satellite? Like, he just doesn't have practice at that. And... You saw that with those outbursts during the campaign, right? I mean, you were just like, oh, this is dramatically unfortunate. You know, I mean, I think that's tactful. Um, you know, but what it was was how, how do you go from being the president to being the first gentleman? Well, you're still first, right? <laughs> and, and presidents are gentlemen, right? It's like, yeah, but go back to war and destiny, that vanity fair, right? I mean, you're not, you're not going to be in that role. And the closer you get to it, the more dangerous you are, because that brings forward all kinds of issues about unelected individuals. So to answer your question, I think that I, I have a lot of compassion for the first gentleman. And the sooner he gets here, the more I have to write about, so that I can be right about him the way I'm right about these women. Um, but I think it's going to be, a, I think it'll be something that's, 
I find this field to be very, this topic to be very revealing of ourselves as a society. And I think that that, that will be very revealing of ourselves as a society. Thank you for the question, for both questions. Any others? Okay. You too. So um, do you believe then that there are some roles that society would find unacceptable for a first lady to be performing? I think that there are roles that society finds unacceptable for first ladies. Absolutely, I do. Now, the thing about that is that when you talk about society, it's kind of like, okay, so it's like the winner takes all in, in the public opinion polls, right? Because one of the things that, that first ladies have said, and that I think is very fair, is that everything they do is going to be critiqued. And I would add that everything they do will have supporters. So this process of kind of finding your support and building your support and how you turn it into a society level of support is, is really what the challenge is for them. Because they are very heavily scrutinized and very heavily critiqued. Those four roles which are, are so honorable and so important, are also very traditional roles for women. So I didn't put up there, for example, the role of policy entrepreneur. That's still something that makes people uncomfortable. And, and if you look at, at, at kind of the societal views of, of, of women and, and their relationship to power, and we're, now we're looking at stereotypes and the dynamics that surround stereotypes, you know, the scheming concubine, right? Oh my God, you know, you bring sex the verb into it and it's like, oh, what's she doing, right? Um, you know, this was the thing with Betty Ford when she was very forthright and said, you know, Jerry and I have pillow talk. And I thought, oh my God, you actually said that, you know? I mean, like, she actually said that they slept in the same bed. That was a scandal that was reported in all the papers. <gasps> First lady said they slept in the same bed. They've got four children. They've done it before, <laughs> you know? So... Your question, I think, is, is, a very, is, is absolutely on point. Um, society has st stated very clearly, remember that, you know, when first ladies were real ladies. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's where it stops. And I think that, that by being more aware of, of, of our evaluations and our knowledge, hence my quiz, then we, we start thinking more clearly. And we may want to start thinking more clearly about how to honor mothers, right? as well as thinking more clearly about how to um, also respect uh, women as wage earners. That was, thank you. Thank you. Which first lady is your favorite? Oh. <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of like when you have to pick between kids, you know? I mean, I, I'm told, I don't have children, but I am told that that's just not done. Um, so I, I find that there are things in all of them that, that I just kind of admire. Um, and I, I also find that, that, that they take me, they humble me. Because I was, uh, again, working in the papers in the archives today. And um, at various points in Betty Ford's tenure in the White House, there are comments about her fragility, right? Um, not just in terms of the, the breast cancer, which was, I mean, Let's see how good somebody is after an amputation, right? Let, let's not wrap this up, okay? Um, but also because she was someone who had suffered from chronic pain and who was known to have consulted a psychiatrist, thank God, it's called mental health care, right? Um, and so they go back and forth. And I was looking at her travel schedules during the 1976 campaign, and I, I, just, I just called Donna over and I was like, I would have been on my knees. I mean, I would not have been able to do this. Three flights in one day with speaking engagements, like day after day after day. And we're not talking just, oh, you know, like whatever, right? I mean, at one point, she flew from Maryland to New York, stayed in New York overnight, then flew from New York to New Jersey with speaking engagements in both places so that she could fly from New Jersey out to Iowa and back again to Maryland. That was all in one day. Yeah, over and over again. So. I think they humble me, and um, since I'm not terribly strategic, you could probably tell I'm a little too direct for that. Um, their subtlety also makes me um, respect their patience. So I really have to say all of them. And then on the days when I can pick a child, I think I would have to go with uh, Lady Bird Johnson. 
I think that Lyndon Johnson was a handful. <laughs> I mean, right? Who would you marry? Lyndon Johnson or Gerald Ford? Well, duh. <laughs> right? Gerald Ford. Okay? I mean, please. Um, so I think that she really, she really had um, a challenge on her hands in the, in the president that she was working with and for and married to. And I also think that she pioneered, um, for example, independent campaigning in a way and to an extent that others had laid the groundwork for. Okay, Eleanor Roosevelt, everybody pulls in Eleanor Roosevelt. But um, to be able to do it, to confront crowds that you knew hated you in the South, to stand there as a Texan um, and, and to kind of like use all of the code to argue for a dramatic change in policy, mm, that's a kind of courage that, that, that goes beyond humbling me. I mean, I just kind of step back and I'm like, okay, write carefully because you're making judgments about a woman that, that did a great deal. Um, but that said, uh, even the ones that drive me crazy, right? They, they do make me kind of write carefully, which I think is a gift. You know, so often that's not the emotion that you get in political science. You don't get write carefully. It's like, ah, why are they wrong? <laughs> Didn't they know this was going to be a problem? You know, and, and no, they, they don't do that. Thank you for that question. Um, you mentioned that uh, three of the women had presidential appointments. Yes. I only caught that it was Eleanor Roosevelt. Can you tell us the other two and what their specific roles were? And you know, I realized I did that and I thought I should go back and then I was like, oh, but I'm flowing. So thank you very much <laughs> for that question. Flowing on, as the kids would say, one of my little tangents. Okay, so the three are, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, has a presidential appointment, which elicited serious questions from the media about whether the president would ever fire her. <laughs> okay, and he did, right? Um, the, the, the controversy from Congress became too great. She was viewed as introducing socialist elements into the government. And um, her FBI file was quite thick. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll tell you when I got a joke. That one's data true. Um, so that's the first one, and that's the one that I did mention. The second presidential appointment came from President Carter to his wife. She was to have been the chair of the Mental Health, the President's Commission on Mental Health. Um, when they consulted the Office of Legal Counsel and the Department of Justice, they found that for reasons of nepotism, she could not hold that office. So what they did was um, they cut a deal, right, and, and nobody took them to court, so that's the best kind of deal. And she became the honorary chair, but she was in fact involved in every, she attended, she was involved in um, selecting all of the personnel, she attended all of the hearings. Um, so she was very much uh, a, a powerful force. And then of course she was the leading face on the media campaign that took the report out and, and brought the, the act to fruition in Congress and then provided it with a budget. That act incidentally uh, was unfunded. Uh, the funding was taken away by the Reagan administration. So of all the things that Rosalind minded, and there were many um, about losing in 1980, that was one of the most biting that she said. The third appointment, um, and you all, all, all probably know this one, um, but it gives me a chance to talk, so thank you for that question, um, was Hillary Rodham Clinton, and she was named as chair of the President's Task Force on Healthcare Reform. What you may not know is that she was, um, Later challenged uh, in that role, it was said that she was not um, an official of the federal government and therefore closed door meetings were not acceptable. Uh, the Clintons took that to court and won recognition for the first lady as a de facto federal official who could conduct her uh, meetings behind closed doors. So it was a tremendous advance for the first lady to have that, that third appointment with Clinton, Rod Rodham Clinton being willing to fight for the powers of it. So Roosevelt, Carter, and Clinton are the three presidential appointees. Thank you. Your uh, <clears throat> voting for uh, Lady Bird as your favorite uh, compels me to share an anecdote. Okay. Uh, this is a number of years ago back in the uh, middle 1960s. Uh, I shared the podium uh, with about five people and one of those five people at the College of the Virgin Islands holding its first graduation. One of those people was Lady Bird Johnson. That's right. And uh, as my wife and I were approaching the college, uh, which was on 
housed in the former marine barracks near the airport on St. Thomas. Uh, the traffic jam was so uh, prodigious that uh, I said, I'm jumping out here and taking a shortcut, otherwise I'm going to miss the staging area. And uh, my wife, Connie, moved on, uh, with the moved the car along, and I started up a berm uh, toward one of the barracks buildings where we were to meet. Um, I literally, literally ran into the president's wife, came up over the edge of the berm, and ran right into Lady Bird, who promptly uh, tipped over into the arms of Dr. Melville Evans, who was at that time health commissioner of the U.S. Virgin Islands. He later became governor of the islands. Uh, there was no secret service around anywhere, otherwise I'm sure I would have been apprehended and <laughs> vetted thoroughly. And uh, uh, later on we were on the podium and uh, when uh, we left the podium, she came into a line uh, along with the governor of the island to shake about 1,800 hands. I was about 1790 when uh, uh, my turn came up to shake her hand, and she called me by name. She said, it was interesting running into you, <laughs> or you running into me. And uh, we carried on just a very brief conversation. I've always had an admiration for her. There's also a footnote to that. When I was a senior in high school, they sponsored a wildflower essay contest, yes. which I won. I was the last one to hand in my manuscript, but I did win the $35 first prize, and uh, when I found out that uh, Lady Bird Johnson was a, an advocate for wildflowers, uh, I was once again endeared to her as well. Thank you. Um, I was very surprised to hear something that you, what you said about Bess Truman, uh, far grittier than you know we you know that image of her that we have. Um, also of Lady Bird, you know, we thought of her primarily as the wildflowers and the beautification and not so much rat extermination. And I just wonder, did, do you find that there was a um, concerted effort to keep them, you know, a more softer feminine type image in the public? Or uh, do you think that's just the way history has turned out? I, I think that there are several things at work. I think that we do prefer to simplify our memories. And when we simplify them in the direction of, of, of happy, um, it's more comfortable than when we simplify them in the direction of evil. And so we tend to remember the first ladies in very stark terms. So uh, for example, I had forgotten uh, Barbara Bush, when she started campaigning in 1988, I had forgotten that she had such a terrible reputation, right? Um, you remember she, she said, you know, what was that line? Well, I'm not going to say what I think of her, but it rhymes with rich, yeah. right? All of a sudden, you all remembered that. Um, we always think of <coughs> her as, as really kind of this, this very grandmotherly, three rolls of pearls kind of thing. You want to remember that in 1988 and again in 1992, she was so forthright on the campaign trail. Do you know who ran kind of interference for her and calmed the staff down after they were dressed down by Barbara Bush? George W. Yes. That's kind of how he earned his spurs, I guess, um, within that campaign. So I think that, that in many instances, we have really chosen to remember these women in very stark terms. And so, for example, Eleanor Roosevelt is not always remembered as this champion at all. So that's step one. I think that we do tend to simplify our politics and our memory. I think that step two in this is that there are ways in which our society ascribes roles to women. And those ascriptions um, have really lagged with regard to first ladies. Right? And so as a result, uh, our memories remake them in the directions that accent either their uh, conformity or their rejection of, of those kinds of traditional roles. That's why, respectfully, I think it's time for us to grow up as a society and really kind of start thinking about these women as they were, because what they are and what they were is 
it's really quite amazing. Why would we deny ourselves the opportunity to realize how extraordinary human beings can be, right? So I think that that for me, um, since I'm a great lover of grit, and um, I would never say that these women have been consistently wise. They have made colossal mistakes, right? I mean, when you're on this big a stage, you're going to make colossal mistakes. But um, they are extraordinary. So that's, that's where I would just go with it. Is I, I think that what we're looking at is kind of the power of, of our frames and our archetypes, and wouldn't it be good if we could grow beyond them? And uh, the clock says 106, so I've had you for six extra minutes, so I better give it back to Geyer. And if you have more questions, I hope you will come up and just say hello or whatever. Thank you. Stay up there. interesting and entertaining uh, presentation. Uh, based on my quiz results, I may not be graduating on time this year. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as a token of our appreciation, we have a special gift to commemorate your visit to the Ford Library. Not one, but two pens with President Ford signature. Both excellent thank tools you. for grading quizzes and exams. And taking <laughs> notes at the library. Exactly. Oh, thank you. Oh, right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Before we close, if you have not signed up for our email list and would like to do so, we have a form, and we will send you notifications of future programs. Uh, so thank you again for coming and for your excellent questions, and we hope to see you back in the fall when the weather is much warmer. And when <laughs> it has to be. Program scheduling. So now I invite you to uh, meet our speaker and enjoy the reception. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Oh, that was okay? That was great.